Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim. Today, we're discussing the buying, selling, and enslaving of people in the 21st century, in other words, today, and how we, how we stop it. With guests, Dr. Sandra Morgan, Director of the Global Center for Women and Justice at Vanguard University, and Annie Rodriguez, Executive Director of Generate Hope Incorporated in San Diego, California. So thank you both for joining us. It's just wonderful to have you. It's, it, it's such an important, important topic, and it's out of sight. And that's the thing that, that we're trying to correct, do a small part to correct today. I know you spend your entire careers, you and your staffs, your, your boards, your donors spend, your, spend so much of your resource in this life to correct this. So I'm going to set you up. I'm going to go over to you, uh, Sandra. But uh, I, I just want to uh, sort of introduce the topic by saying that Although slavery and human trafficking in, in American Europe was driven underground in the 19th century, it's still here with us. And today's revenue totals from this, this form of slavery um, and the buying and selling of human beings, um, it totals uh, uh, an industry-wide $150 billion annually. Um, and that's according to the International Labor Organization. Um, now, we're not talking euphemistically. We're talking about real buying and real selling of human beings. Children and adults are primarily uh, traded to extract profit from their labor and to be sex workers. And the profits themselves are what is driving international growth. And, and the growth is indeed international. And we are seeing this really pervade uh, the world. So Dr. Morgan, let's start with you. Could you just uh, help us understand the sheer scale of this, uh, of this issue? and how it has infected the world and how, and we'll talk about uh, how we can stop it, but let's, let's just talk about the scale of this issue. From a global perspective, there isn't a, a continent that has no signs of human trafficking. So globally, this is an issue. And I appreciate that you have um, bracketed this with sex trafficking and labor trafficking. Labor trafficking, um, according to most uh, research, is about three times as prevalent as sex trafficking. And in labor trafficking, there is a great deal of abuse and sexual assault as well. So I want our listeners to have empathy for both um, types of human trafficking. I'm, my background's pediatric nursing. I teach at a traditional undergrad university. And so I learn a lot when I study children and I discovered in Africa, there is a greeting among Maasai warriors. How are all the children? And as I began to explore that, if the children are doing well, then the adults are doing well. And so I want to um, use the latest report that came out from the International Labor Affairs Bureau that shows increases in child labor and child trafficking, which included um, moving from um, 72 and a half million of children in hazardous work to 79 million in 2020, and going from 152 million of children in child labor to 160. So we're losing ground. We're not making progress. And the idea of demand that drives the uh, focus uh, from a business perspective of cheap products and a higher profit margin, um, greed is what drives human trafficking. And it's not just business owners, it's ours. When we shop, human trafficking is on the rack. It's on the shelf in our stores. It's such an important point. Annie, uh, could you just uh, give us your take on, on the problem? I'm gonna, get, I'm gonna go, then go into the various programs that you offer. And incidentally, uh, Colleen Zimmerman just uh, gave, gave us a prompt. Uh, thank you, Colleen. Uh, um, Colleen said that she wanted to draw everybody's attention to the University of Michigan Human T Trafficking uh, Collaborative, and we'll post the website later on under the video. But um, uh, Annie, uh, could you just give us the, the view from your perspective? 
Yes. So in San Diego, we are one of the top 13 areas for high intensity commercial exploitation of minors and human trafficking. Um, in San Diego alone, it's estimated that there can be up to 8,000 new victims of this horrible crime. And that's just here. We know that there's been some research done about just that, that the traffickers or perpetrators are starting to look at children who are much younger um, and much more vulnerable. Often, what, age, what ages are you talking about here? So the average age of, um, of a human trafficking victim is, um, or when they get kind of introduced to human trafficking is um, 16 years old. And through the pandemic, as we have had younger and younger children have access to social media, we're starting to see victimization go down. And we're looking at children who are 12, 13, 14, who are being recruited um, into sex trafficking. And so- and you're talking about not, not numbers going down, numbers are going up, but the ages are, are, are coming down. So it's going from an average age of 16 and it's, it's beginning to migrate downwards. So you have more uh, children um, and, and uh, brought into this system. And it's an acculturated system, right? You get acculturated into this system and that becomes your life. Correct. And I think what we find in our experience is that oftentimes um, children or, or youth are trapped into this um, slavery for an average of five to eight years. And so by the time they come to us um, to seek services, they're in their early 20s and some, you know, are much older and have been engaged in a life of exploitation for a much longer time. Now, there's a nefarious piece to this, because if you're a human trafficker, if you are somebody who makes money by enslaving others, you want to increase the lifetime of service of your what, it, what has become the product. So by going younger, you might go from an average uh, time in service to uh, five years to eight years. And all of a sudden, as, as someone who is exploiting others, uh, for gain, you're actually uh, doing an analysis that is going to optimize your profit. So you get a worldwide profit of 150 billion going to 180 billion and, or, or 200 billion just by tweaking the tweaking the model. We have to respond. How do we how do we respond in a way that reduces the ability of these traffickers to be successful and takes the money out of this business, uh, Sandra? I believe that we need to focus more on prevention in the Palermo Protocol and in our own um, Trafficking Victims Protection Act. We have um, the basic three Ps, prevention, protection, and prosecution. We've, If you looked at that like a AAA guide to hotels, prosecution would have four dollar signs and prevention probably less than one. Most prevention is considered awareness, actually. And so I believe we need a focus on prevention in our schools that is um, equitable and accessible to any school anywhere in America. In Annie's um, area in San Diego, they have an amazing prevention program that goes into the schools. It um, is offered because they got a four and a half million dollar grant. Um, the school down the street from me doesn't have a budget for prevention. So I believe that we have to start focusing on prevention. I'm a, I'm a healthcare professional. Public health is, uh, teaches us that we have to predict, protect, and prevent. That's why we teach our kids to brush their teeth as soon as the first one pops through the gums. And we need to do the same thing here. And I, I really wanna to respond to what Annie said about online um, explosion. Um, child sexual abuse material. Start watching for the acronym CSAM. And then look, do a search for SG-CSAM because during COVID, the sexual exploitation of children and adults 
um, online has just exploded and children are offered money to post pictures of themselves. And from a physiological perspective, their ability to manage risk and use their executive decision-making is not even developed. And so for them, it seems like, hey, I don't know these people. They, they don't live near me. They're going to Venmo me $200. Sure. And so prevention means teaching children from a very young age, internet safety and who is a trusted adult. Let's step back a little bit. Let's talk a little bit about definitions because um, we're, we're in a big, big area, not a black and white, but of, but of, of gray and a, and a lot of, there's a continuum. There's a lot of gaslighting that you're referring to uh, here, Sandra, and that happens in the labor markets as well. Um, when, when you look at, at the end product, which is basically figuring out a way to exploit a person um, and, and give them no choice, which is what slavery is. You're, you're, you're removing choice and then you are taking, the, taking from them, right? Um, can, can we talk a little bit about the definition of, of what we're talking about that connects to human trafficking, that, that sort of modern forms of slavery and then connects to human trafficking because the human trafficking themself, itself is a profit center. You get money from people who might be paying you. Um, you're trading amongst people where the supply and demand is creating this transaction, and that's creating a, a profit. And then also, once that trafficking has taken place, the exploitation that follows also has, has a, a profit center. So, Annie, could you just talk a little bit about how you look at the definitions uh, surrounding these issues here out of San Diego and Generate Hope? Yeah, I hope I understand your question. I think what we often see is is a victim that's identified, that's targeted, um, and who is uh, being exploited through force, fraud, or coercion. Um, I think oftentimes victims, um, you know, there's there's some some misconceptions about how um, you know how it happens, and oftentimes we hear, you know, these are foreign nationals or, or trafficking or sex trafficking doesn't happen in the United States. When in fact, over 80, 80 to 90% of victims of, um, of human trafficking and sex trafficking specifically are US born um, children, women, um, men. And I think that that's a, a big misconception that we often have, oftentimes when I share with people that we provide shelter and services to survivors of human trafficking. Um, many people say here, you know, in San Diego, there's victims. And I think there's a lot of misconceptions about that. But it's everywhere, right? It's in New York City. It's in Chicago. It's in Toledo, Ohio. It's everywhere. Um, it's pervasive. Why, why has it spread so uh, completely? Is it because this pre-existed the internet, of course, the internet has sort of supercharged it. Is it really just a matter of, of, uh, of uh, opportunity? Do we have uh, laws that are too weak? Sandra, you pointed to the lack of prevention. Annie, from your perspective, why is it so pervasive and why is it so dominant here in the United States? I think um, there's a, a lot of reasons, but one of the primary reasons, it's just, it's very low risk for the traffickers. Um, so you, you know, when you, the, you know, the number one kind of uh, money-making uh, criminal element, it, it has been for a long time, um, you know, the illicit sales of, of drugs in our country. But once you are, when you're trafficking drugs, there's a risk of being, getting caught with a product, right? And, and being arrested. And there's laws that are, um, that, that people will have some severe consequences. Um, with human trafficking, um, your product is another person. It's um, a person who, who takes all the risk. The trafficker doesn't take the risk, it's the victim. And so, um, there's low risk 
in, involved in this. The oftentimes you get pulled over or a trafficker or pimp will get pulled over. Um, and the victim will not disclose that they're a victim. They and, might not even register that, that, that they're, that, that they're actually being exploited in that way. This might be for them the best choice that they could be making. That's correct. They think that they're part of this game um, and that they're willing participants oftentimes um, before they kind of awaken and realize that they are being used and exploited. And so, um, yeah, so I, I really think the fact that it's low risk, um, there's uh, an opportunity to make a lot of money um, and that there's an endless supply of victims Um available or potential victims in the community. And I think that those are some of the reasons that there's been an increase in, um, in, in this horrible, horrible crime. And Sandra, you had referred previously to exploitation of labor um, and, and how that is about four, roughly four, four X, the, the uh, issue of sex trafficking. Um, how does exploitation of labor work? In the, in the same the same elements are um, evident in both practices. And when you look at internationally or nationally, that force, fraud or coercion. I, and when we when we talk about choice being taken from people, um, the people that are the most vulnerable already don't have very many choices. They don't have options. So when when someone offers them a job um, they don't, their level of risk is, oh, I can stay here homeless, or maybe this is going to be great. Um, you and I, we've got a house, a car. We're not, we're not going to risk all of that to take that job. And I, and I think understanding force and fraud is pretty black and white. We, we can tell. Um, but the coercion piece um, is a lot harder to, to tease out the elements of that because it's more psychological um, manipulation. And Annie, you used the word, um, the phrase, the game. And it reminded me, Rachel Thomas, who serves on the White House Human Trafficking Advisory Council, I interviewed her on the Ending Human Trafficking podcast that we do out of the Global Center for Women and Justice. And she identified and broke down coercion in a way that applies whether you're talking about sex trafficking or labor trafficking. And I think it's really important for people who want to go and rescue um, to understand there is a trauma bond to the trafficker and there are risks that the victim perceives we, that we don't see, but they are trapped, even though there are no bars, there are no locks. Well, it's the Stockholm syndrome in part, but it's, but it's even more sophisticated than that. We just did a uh, poll uh, uh, coming to the end of it, where we asked, where does human trafficking take place? And um, about three quarters of the people answered that it takes place everywhere. Um, um, but about a quarter of them uh, answered that it's mostly in regions of uh, high poverty and high crime. Um, care to comment? Poverty is the number one risk factor for human trafficking across the board. And sometimes I get a little frustrated with our upside down approach. We advocate for kids to get an education because we know that will end poverty. But the kids who are already in poverty aren't in the classroom. They're um, picking cotton in Uzbekistan so we can have cheap T-shirts or um, picking cocoa beans so we can have cheap um, chocolate. Well, that's the point, right? Um, any activity that generates a profit is generating a profit from the people who have. So while the exploitation might physically pay, take place in Uzbekistan, uh, Uzbekistan uh, we're actually funding it through our cheap uh, goods. It's no different than if we were in the 1850s and buying on a global market the cheapest cotton that was there and the best cotton that was there, which was derived from the slave labor in the United States. Um, uh, from from that industry. So 
uh, is, are, are we all in a sense complicit by the choices that we make in this labor exploitation I'm, I'm talking about? Um, are we in a sense um, complicit? Um, and, and, and how do we, how do we deal with this, Annie? Um, how do we change our behaviors? How do we process this so that when we're buying stuff, we're not funding um, slave uh, labor someplace else? Yeah, and so I'm not an expert in labor trafficking, but one of the things that we need to be more aware of is where our products are coming from. Um, we need to, and there's a lot of, and I can't think of any right now, but there's a lot of um, resources available online that share um, which companies we shouldn't be doing business with because they are, um, you know, exploiting um, labor and that they are victimizing people um, in a way that um, we shouldn't support. And so I think that we need to be more aware of, of where we're spending our money and we need to um, be more committed to um, other sources of where our products come from. Can I, can I jump oh, in it, and tell you that you can have a thousand pages of research on everything you just talked about, Annie, by downloading the Sweat and Toil app. And when you're in the supermarket and you see the bananas, because we put the sticker for what country it comes from, you can look that up. It takes a moment and it's a great way to start teaching your children early about labor trafficking and other forms. Um, it'll tell you if trafficking, if slave labor is part of that product. The Sweat and Toil app? I sweat heard and of. Toil app. And then there is a, um, a new app that just came out called Comply, also from our Department of Labor with lots of research. And Department of Labor now has the capacity to issue withholding orders at the port. And if recently... Um, for instance, rubber gloves from Malaysia were stopped because of evidence in the supply chain of labor trafficking. Well, that's going to interfere with our folks on the ground here when they're, they, can't, they can't get what they ordered. So I, the Comply app and the Sweat and Toil app are easy, free ways to have the research at your fingertips. Now, one of the things that we've learned through this climate change uh, uh, discussion that is going on in the world today is that our small act acts can have big impacts, right? So uh, is there a way that we can take small corrective acts that, um, that also have uh, big impacts? Th thank you so much for, uh, for sharing those apps with us because when we're sitting there and we're buying bananas, I mean, we, we read uh, these very big stories about the exploitation of of primates in the harvesting of coconuts uh, for uh, coconut uh, um, water and so on. Um, and if we're if we're if we're so concerned about primates, well, we're primates, right? It's it, it, it it's our labor as well. And if we're going to buy uh, cheap goods, we should really understand that 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 uh, what the practices are that that allow those uh, goods to be uh, to be so cheap. We just uh, completed a, a uh, poll here, which was really interesting. We asked, now, which of the following facts are are surprising to you uh, about human trafficking? And I'm going to read a couple of different areas that, that seem to garner a lot of attention. That uh, one, victims uh, may collaborate in hiding trafficking. We're going to talk about that. And we're going to talk about the techniques and the psychology that leads to that. And then there are a couple of other areas that victims of trafficking may not be processing that they're victims at all. Um, that human trafficking doesn't always involve uh, kidnapping or any kind of physical restraint. We'll talk about that. Um, and uh, that uh, the victims may be a, a, of any age. So let's sort of hack those off and, and uh, talk about them. First of all, this whole idea of active collaboration by victims, the fact that they don't process that that they may be victims, an act of collaboration. Addy, could you give us sort of a um, a storyline that you see often um, that falls into that category uh, that makes it so difficult for enforcement to take place and even prevention to take place? 
Yeah, so the most common way that um, victims of sex trafficking get lured into the life is um, begins with fraud. And so oftentimes we use a, a word called boyfriending. And so it's an older, an older guy, you know, trying to uh, boyfriend a younger gal. And so what we see is that there's a science to the way that in a method that the way this is done. And so oftentimes, you know, we have our, our, um, our founder is a survivor herself. And she shares a story about um, and asks us all to think about a 14 or 15 year old girl or boy that we know and think about yourself at 15 or 14 and, and how vulnerable you are, how you just want to fit in, how your body is changing. Um, and those people that give you attention are people that you want to be around. And so a trafficker will groom their victim by telling them what they want to hear that they're, whether it's that they're beautiful, that they're worthy, whether it's that they can help them. Um, so oftentimes they buy things for them and they um, tell them how much they love them and they wrap them up in a place where when, by the time they ask them to engage in a commercial sex act, they are, they can't imagine their life without this individual. This individual will isolate them from their family and friends. Um, and will say, you know, we're, you're doing this for us. And that, that often is where the game starts, right? It's fraud. Well, it's also applying the logic of an adult to a child, right? And you're basically saying to, to a child, uh, you're an adult, uh, you have free will, and then you use popular culture as, as the connection, right? You're, you can do this, you're great, you're wonderful, this is going to be fun, and so on. And then, and then at a certain point, Maybe the light bulb doesn't go off for five years. Yeah, and I think that's when the force and the coercion go in. So oftentimes they manipulate them by saying, now that you've done this, you know, nobody's going to want you. Or they, they threaten to expose them to their family, friends, and community. And that's, um, that's where the trauma bonds are able to grow stronger because it's now like I have nobody to turn to um, and that manipulation and, and the trafficker will say, you know, you're lucky to have me. Um, and that keeps them trapped and that we're doing this together. Um, so that will, will, will keep them in that relationship or in that um, in exploitation for a long, long time until there's, something that happens, whether it's an arrest or whether it's an injury or whether their brain just develops to a point where they start to understand that they are not willing participants in this. And that's when they seek help. So, Sandra, we're coming to the end of our time. So we're going to give you the last word. Uh, we purposely asked whether uh, people after watching the webinar so far, whether they feel better equipped to identify whether someone is a, is a human trafficking victim. And about 40% said, not yet, not yet. So you helped in terms of, of, of uh, providing some insight into the labor side and, and you gave us a couple of websites, which we will publish under the, um, uh, under the, uh, the posted video. Uh, but could you give us some um, indication of how we can, in our daily lives, as we're walking through uh, town, as we are uh, going, uh, as we're traveling on, on uh, public transportation, as we are interacting with people in stores, um, what should we be looking for um, as, as signs of this type of activity? I think we're looking for um, people that are in the wrong place with the wrong group. Shaima Hall was an Egyptian child brought to Orange County as a child slave household maid. And she recently uh, participated in a training at John Wayne Airport with us. And she said, oh, a white man took me through an airport. I never looked up. 
I never spoke. He always did all the speaking and no one ever asked me if I was okay. And I think it's also important that if you ask them, and I've heard this from from lots of different sex trafficking victims as well as or just day before yesterday, um, no one asked me if I'm okay. Ask if they come through um, a clinic, if they come through um, a store, if they're at the pharmacy, um, are you okay? Can I help you? And if you see something and you don't know what to do, at least call the human trafficking hotline, which is 888 373 And they'll walk you through things that you can do locally and you can give them um, a tip. Um, You can text my younger students. They don't want to make a phone call. They just want to make a text. And the be free 233733 is how you text. And about 20%, I think, at the hotline last year were texts. So what you're saying is be aware, be observant. When you see something, say something, but it, but, but it goes further than that. When you, when you look at something and you, and you see something that looks dissonant, mm-hmm. it, it doesn't look right. Um, uh, uh, people of perhaps different races and radically different ages, um, a person, a young person who is perhaps look like they're, they're, they're in a shell, um, and, and being guided and so on, uh, that should really spark something in each of us. And that we can see in our supermarkets, that we can see in our airports and our transit centers. We can actually take a small action, a small action to, uh, to, to try and help others. Dr. Sandra Morgan, uh, Director of the Global Center for Women and Justice at Vanguard University, and Annie Rodriguez, Executive Director of Generate Hope Incorporated in San Diego. Thank you so much for your work and for sharing some of the insights that you possess with us. And please thank your staffs, your donors, uh, and your your supporters, and also those people who were victim and have become- (laughs) (laughs) My uh, light went out, there you go. Who have become uh, inspiration um, and educators uh, to us all. Uh, Have a great day, stay safe, and thank you so much. Thank you, thank you.